Good afternoon and welcome to this OPERA's webinar. It's the fifth webinar in this current series. And today we will be looking at the topic of what should the European Union consider to move towards no net loss. Uh, we have two speakers with us today, uh, Dr. Astrid van Tevelen at the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and Fabien Quetier, who works on ecosystem services and biodiversity offsets at Biotop in France. As with our previous webinars, we're very keen to get your questions and your comments on what is being presented. If you would like to submit a question, you will see on the right hand side of your screen some boxes and one of them is titled questions. If you click on the question box and type in your comment or question, then that gets sent uh, to my colleague Kathleen who directs it to me and we can then pick up your question and ask you actually to, to speak yourself and ask your question to the presenters. We'll have three presentations all together. Uh, Fabien will be starting, we'll then go to Astrid and then back to Fabien for the end. In between all of those presentations, we will be opening the floor for questions and comments, anything that you might have. So once again, if you look at the right hand side of your screen, you will see there's a questions box and please just type in your question there and we will then pick it up and you can then ask your question directly to the presenters. But without any further ado, um, it's my pleasure to hand the microphone over to Fabien, who's going to be looking at concepts and legal frameworks for no net loss. Fabia, are you online and ready to address us? I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we're absolutely fine. Okay, and can you see my, uh, my slide? Yes, that's in clear view. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so, I, my my task with this first presentation is to uh, provide a, a, an overview of the, the concept behind low net loss and uh, uh, give some uh, insights into uh, the legal frameworks uh, for that. And uh, uh, this, uh, this will, uh, will then give us a, a shared understanding for, for Astrid's presentation and then for some of the um, uh, more local implementation uh, uh, questions that I'll be looking at in the third, in the third presentation. So my, uh, uh, just to lay the ground for, for the discussion, um, it's, it's worth mentioning that in, uh, in Europe's uh, biodiversity strategy from 2011, uh, there were a number of, of uh, targets uh, laid out and, and actions uh, aimed at achieving those targets. and. Uh, one of them in particular, Action 7, uh, was to ensure no net loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, and there was uh, uh, an intention uh, for the Commission to propose by 2015 an initiative uh, to uh, uh, achieve this uh, or to implement this action and, and achieve the goal of maintaining and enhancing ecosystems and their services through compensation or offsetting schemes. Um, so there's since 2011, there's been a lot of uh, work uh, at uh, the European level on uh, trying to establish what this means uh, and how, in practice, uh, can compensation or offsetting schemes be used uh, to achieve this target. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, work that's been happening in parallel to uh, uh, the research being done uh, in operas, uh, uh, but there has been uh, uh, it, it, has, it has offered us uh, an interesting uh, background and framework in which to, uh, to carry out this, uh, this research. So speaking of definitions, 
the policy makers in Brussels uh, put some, some effort into that. And so, for example, uh, uh, one agreed definition is that no net loss means uh, that when you have a loss of biodiversity or ecosystem services in, in a particular uh, area, uh, then you, you can achieve no net loss by balancing that loss uh, by a gain that will be achieved elsewhere. And to do that, uh, the, you need an effective regulatory framework. You need to build on what member states have been doing for a while, and, and I'll be giving an example of, of that. Uh, but also uh, best practice approaches and standards that have been developed uh, elsewhere. And one example uh, that uh, comes to mind quite readily is that of the Business and Biodiversity Offsets Program. <coughs> this program, called BIOP, um, uh, was established uh, um, to bring together conservation NGOs, financial institutions, governments, companies, <coughs> to try and uh, uh, bring together their, their respective experiences and, and uh, uh, create a standard of, for, for designing uh, offsets uh, for applying the mitigation hierarchy so as to deliver uh, no net loss. And so they offer a definition, uh, which is uh, um, one of the most widespread today, where biodiversity offsets uh, are um, produce measurable conservation outcomes. This is a really important uh, element of one, what an offset is. Uh, it's not a financial payment. Uh, it actually has to deliver measurable outcomes on the ground. Another key uh, aspect is that uh, these offsets aim to address residual impacts, those impacts that couldn't uh, be avoided or sufficiently uh, uh, mitigated. So there is this idea that you need to approach uh, biodiversity impacts sequentially, first through avoidance, then through minimization, and then if you have residual impacts, then this is where you need to implement these offsets so uh, as to achieve no net loss. And one of the main, uh, I guess, concepts that uh, the people have introduced into the discussion is to actually have a measurable goal for the mitigation hierarchy, which is to achieve no net loss and preferably a net gain of biodiversity. Um, this work in BBOP uh, wasn't specific to Europe, and in fact uh, it was uh, very much related to uh, performance standards and requirements from uh, financial institutions, from investors, uh, who were seeking to manage risks uh, um, in relation to their projects and their investments. And so, for example, uh, the International Finance Corporation, which is a branch of the World Bank, has its own standard that uh, sets no net loss and net gain as goals for projects that uh, it finances, which is when they're located in natural habitats or in critical habitats for biodiversity. So there is, uh, outside Europe, uh, in countries where the World Bank operates, uh, a clear goal uh, for some projects to achieve no net loss and net gains. And this has, has provided us uh, here in Europe with, with some interesting experiences. I'll just give you two uh, sort of better known examples uh, from Madagascar, two big mining projects, where you can see that uh, these projects were causing the loss of uh, quite significant areas of, uh, of uh, native forests with a lot of uh, threatened species, of, um, species with restricted ranges. And so the, the, the two mining companies, Ambatovi and Rio Tinto, while they had to explain uh, how they were addressing these losses uh, through avoidance, were there any parts of their mineral resources that they were uh, uh, not going to exploit so as to uh, uh, avoid impacting uh, those, those particular areas of forest, what they were going to do to uh, um, uh, optimize the footprint of their project, for example, to, to minimize uh, minimize those losses. In the particular case of mining, how were they going to restore the area that was being mined uh, once they were gone? And how were they going to offset the residual losses so as to demonstrate no net loss and get access to financing from uh, uh, institutions such as the World Bank? 
And so you can see in the first example, for example, the, that Ambatobi, for the loss of 2,000 hectares of forest, uh, uh, committed to protecting 10 times that area, um, uh, claiming that this would offset their impacts. And, and uh, we can then discuss that uh, a bit later on. Simply, the, the, the logic then of, of this approach is that if you have a biodiversity baseline, which would be the horizontal line on this graph, uh, you can predict a certain level of impact. You can avoid and minimize some of that impact. You can do some restoration in some circumstances. Uh, but what you need to do to demonstrate no net loss is generate a gain somewhere else that is at least as big as the residual losses. And uh, demonstrating no net loss requires uh, this, this sort of quantitative approach. And uh, uh, this is, this is the, the conceptual framework for no net loss that uh, uh, is, is currently being discussed across Europe and that the European Commission is, is, uh, is looking into. This raises a number of questions, of course. Uh, one of them is that you need to be able to measure uh, biodiversity. Uh, and uh, another important question is what qualifies as a gain uh, in, under this framework. So I'll just go through this uh, quite rapidly. Uh, uh, but before I do that, I, of course, want to remind everyone that there are options for avoiding and minimizing uh, impacts. Uh, most of these are actually quite uh, uh, mainstream uh, in, in actual project uh, implementation across Europe. Uh, so I won't go into that and really focus on the on the sort of the new the new thing, which is the offsets. So uh, to demonstrate no net loss, uh, you need to be able to measure your losses and your gains. Yet we all know that there are no there isn't a, a universal metric uh, for biodiversity. And in fact, when when people are talking about no net loss of biodiversity, they they uh, need to specify if they're talking about species, about the habitats of those species, or different habitat types or ecosystem types, or particular processes. And increasingly, uh, people are, are referring to ecosystem services. And this is one thing that, that we looked at in, in Opera, is how do you apply this, this framework uh, to ecosystem services? And the, the other question is, what counts as a biodiversity gain? And to illustrate that, I'll just want to Work, work through a, a theoretical example of how most people spontaneously uh, think about biodiversity offsets. Uh, if you imagine the square here as being uh, a particular type of, of ecosystem, uh, uh, the green ecosystem, uh, and then part of that ecosystem is protected in dark green, if you have a project that's impacting this ecosystem in the unprotected uh, part of it, uh, and, and you ask for, for, for compensation or an offset, you might uh, agree to a ratio of three hectares of compensation for one hectare of, of impact, for example. Uh, and so you end up with a situation like this, where you, you, you protect additional uh, uh, parts of, of the remaining ecosystem. And you go and you do that for the next project and the next one. And what you've done, actually, is by using this ratio of three to one, is you've implicitly accepted to lose part of the remaining unprotected biodiversity that you had when you started. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, uh, you've, done, you've achieved a net loss uh, in spite of maybe having negotiated very hard to get a ratio of three to one. So it, it's really important to, uh, uh, to think these things through. One solution, of course, uh, to this uh, difficulty is to uh, focus not so much on protecting existing biodiversity to offset losses, but to uh, try and look for options to restore uh, habitat. And uh, unlike the forests of Madagascar, Europe has uh, 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 plenty of uh, man-made habitats uh, which have been degraded through intensification, through simplification, and so there are a number of opportunities for uh, restoration to achieve biodiversity gains. Uh, some of those are listed here. In, uh, for example, for hedgerow habitats that are, are typical of, of uh, northwestern Europe. And an important message here is that actually biodiversity offsets, uh, um, be it in Madagascar or in Europe, uh, actually face very much the same challenges as other conservation or restoration actions uh, that have similar uh, biodiversity or ecosystem service targets. So although offsets appear as something new, 
uh, in fact, uh, they, they very much build on, on established uh, know-how and, and capacity. Uh, another important point to raise, of course, is uh, uh, that if you can't generate a, a gain through protection and if you can't generate a gain through restoration, then maybe you shouldn't be accepting uh, the biodiversity loss in the first place. And so it's uh, very important to uh, uh, be aware that not all uh, impacts are acceptable because not, not, uh, not all impacts can be offset. Uh, associated with this idea is the fact that uh, it's uh, important to be aware uh, uh, of these risks uh, and to uh, take them into account explicitly in thinking how a particular project uh, will manage uh, its impacts uh, on biodiversity. And this is somewhat different from uh, simply um, a simply administrative uh, approach to uh, compliance. Um, but uh, it's, it's certainly worthwhile. Um, speaking of administrative compliance, uh, I, would just, I just wanted to uh, uh, lay out an example of what uh, some uh, member states uh, in the European Union have been doing on this topic uh, for a long time now and, and illustrate how it's not actually, uh, uh, no loss isn't completely new and fallen out of the sky, but builds on, on uh, considerable experience in, in member states. Uh, I'll use the case of France, which I, I know best, uh, just to say that we've had uh, the concept of the mitigation hierarchy in our legislation since the 70s, uh, as other countries on the continent. Uh, and uh, there's been a number of uh, successive reforms and, and, and modifications to that that have brought us now to uh, a known net loss type framework. Uh, one of the biggest changes was in 2007 when uh, the process for derogations for protected species was modified uh, for, uh, to get better compliance with the Habitats Directive uh, and locally was partly motivated by the the willingness uh, to be able to shoot wolves, uh, actually, in, in, in French mountains. So this was a, um, uh, an important shift. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, if you look at uh, European Commission guidance from 2007 on the Habitats Directive, it's quite clear that for protected species, uh, what, is, what is sought is no net loss or a net gain uh, as an outcome of allowing impact uh, on those species. And all of this has, has, uh, has led the country, uh, France, to, to uh, an increased use of these derogations uh, and of the no net loss framework, which uh, then um, culminated last year in a new biodiversity law, which has actually made the no net loss goal uh, explicit as an outcome of the permitting of projects that have impacts on biodiversity. Um, so in this particular case, and, and it's very much what we've seen in, in Europe, is that offsets and, and no net loss are built on existing regulations for permitting projects and partly also for, for uh, plans and programs under the polluter pays principle. Uh, um, so although people mention them as being uh, market-based mechanisms uh, um, uh, and the like, uh, the, the, the whole no net loss approach is very much grounded in uh, command and control uh, regulations. But still, and, and as a conclusion, um, they are mentioned as innovative financing mechanisms because they are a way to raise funding from uh, private investors uh, for, uh, for uh, covering the cost of conserving or restoring biodiversity. Um, and uh, they should certainly be managed in a way that they contribute actively to our biodiversity policies. There we go. Thank you. Fabien, thank you very much. Um, we had two quick questions. Uh, the first from the United Nations University, and apologies if I pronounce your name incorrectly, uh, Heonju Ru. Um, and the question is, and you maybe have answered partially already. Does no net loss mean no net loss in ecosystem services? If it's the case, the concept of no net loss may neglect the fact that there is a certain degree of requirement or demand for each ecosystem service or thresholds to sustain a society. Fabien, your thoughts on that? 
Yes, um, so thank you. It's actually a very, uh, very relevant uh, question. Uh, I mentioned that um, even when speaking about the net loss of biodiversity, which is where most practice actually currently originates from, uh, the question remains what biodiversity are we talking about? Is it, spe is it species and which species? Is it a particular type of ecosystem? Um, and so actually, the need to disaggregate and, and to be more specific about the actual features for which you want to achieve no net loss is a question that is uh, uh, that needs to be addressed every time. And so, including ecosystem services is just could possibly is only only means adding extra features uh, to include in in the framework, uh, and, and so they can man be managed that way. However, what the question under uh, I guess what the question expresses is also uh, an important risk. Um, if the, the policy shifts from biodiversity and ecosystem services to simply ecosystem services, um, then uh, some of the requirements uh, may be relaxed because ecosystem services typically are more substitutable uh, than uh, a particular species or a particular habitat type. And so that uh, uh, relaxes one of the requirements of the offsets, uh, which would be uh, the like-for-like -like requirement, where if you're impacting a particular species, then your offsets have to benefit that, that same species. Thank you very much. Um, there's also a follow-up question. Um, whether there are any examples of no net loss being applied to multiple ecosystems services? Um, if this was the case, it, would it not get too complicated? Um, I'll be giving an example of that in the in, in the in the third uh, presentation. But so the answer is yes, and and uh, uh, that's why you you need to have a uh, a process for managing those multiple features, uh, building, for example, on multi-criteria uh, analysis approaches. Uh, and so, uh, in the context of operas and working also with developers, we, we were able to uh, uh, to build these types of frameworks, um, and that's that's one of the, the operas outcomes. Great, and we'll look forward then to learning more about that in, in the third presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, uh, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Just to repeat again. If you have a question or if something is unclear or you're wondering what well, sounds very nice in theory, but how would you put this into practice and you would like to pose that to our speakers, then please just go to the questions box. It's on the right hand side of the screen. Just type in the question there and we'll either pick it up or directly come to you and offer you the chance to, to speak directly to our presenters uh, with your question. But for now, it's my great pleasure to hand, or invite rather, um, Astrid van Teffelen to uh, give her presentation on scenarios at the EU scale for no net loss. Astrid, are you there? Can I hand over to you? Yes, Martin, thanks very much. Hello everyone, uh, can you hear me and can you see the screen? Yes Astrid, that's all fine, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so what I'll be talking to you about <clears throat> are some results from earlier studies conducted together with, um, with the Institute for Environmental, uh, European Environmental Policy, IEP, Graham Tucker, and my colleagues Nikos Hulp and Peter Faber from the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. So we're building on <clears throat> earlier studies um, using insights from the OPRAS project, but also from earlier European projects, which are Connect and Volanti. So I'll be talking about how to quantify the effect, effectiveness of European policy options towards no net loss. My slides would like to respond. Yes, there we go. So uh, Fabien already introduced, introduced to you the European Union's biodiversity policy and associated to that Action 7, which is to put forward a no net loss initiative. 
moving on from there. So in that context of the No Net Loss Initiative, DG Environment actually requested the development of policy options for such an initiative. And it was a task that IEAP conducted in collaboration with uh, FU IVM, so our university, FTEC and uh, GHK. As part of this study, we conducted um, a quantitative assessment of no net loss policy scenarios. And the results of this scenario modeling study are published as part of the, the overall broader report and its annexes, as well as in a uh, more recent review, peer-reviewed paper in, that was published in Lunch's Policy. And today I present the main outcomes of that scenario modeling study. So we are talking about, well, policy options that actually span across the range of policy sectors. So, for example, fisheries, mining, agriculture, urban planning, forestry, and transportation. Through the different uh, strategies for that, driven free um, and directives, such as Birds and Habitats Directive, uh, Europe, uh, Environmental Liability Directive, Common Agricultural Policy, etc to better enforce existing legislation and identify options for strengthening the legislation. So this is the mitigation hierarchy that Fabien already explained with much more pretty pictures. Uh, so the options we um, investigated spanned the mitigation hierarchy. They included uh, options to avoid impacts, minimize impacts, restore after impacts, and lastly, offset residual impacts. So we're talking about the uh, EU27 here. Um, um, where we were first asked to develop a business as usual scenario for land use change in the EU, which we call in the BAU or business as usual. Um, we derived from the in total set of th about 30 policy options, we derived four policy scenarios, which we termed uh, no net loss scenarios. I'll detail them a bit later on. We simulated land use change for a 20 year period using one of our land use change models. It models land use change on a one square kilometer scale, considering 18 different land use classes. And then based on these land use maps, we quantified the impacts on ecosystem services, ecosystem coverage and quality, which uh, included 15 indicators. And lastly, we compared the effectiveness of these four policy scenarios against the business as usual scenario. So the four no net loss scenarios, just in a nutshell, the lightest scenario was scenario A, um, better enforcement and implementation of existing measures and an encouragement of voluntary offsetting. Then a little bit more ambitious, introducing new and enhanced measures to avoid and reduce impacts and introduce mandatory offsetting for residual impacts from, from EU-funded developments. Further on, development of a policy framework for no net loss with mandatory no net loss objectives for scarce biodiversity and priority ecosystem services and minimum key standards for offsetting at the EU level. And then the most ambitious scenario would be to develop of a policy framework for no-net loss with mandatory no-net loss objectives and key implementation standards for all biodiversity and ecosystem services. So these uh, four scenarios were tested against um, 15 indicators. We had 10 ecosystem services indicators, which are here uh, identified in blue and five ecosystem or biodiversity indicators, including ecosystem coverage, that's just the area of particular ecosystem types, um, whether land take happened, which means that land that is um, uh, still forest or semi-natural habitat that is converted to agriculture, or it also includes agricultural land that is being built up. So you could say like a more anthrop um, um, more land that comes from a more natural state into a more anthropogenic state is called land take and the vice versa through uh, restoration for example would be land gain. A measure for connectivity of the habitats and um, an index for uh, bird species richness which was split out into annex one species and farmland bird species and a measure of mean species abundance. I'm not detailing results for all of these 15 indicators but I'm just picking out some of the results to give you uh, just an overview, but you, I refer to the, um, to the two documents for, if you would like to look into the details. 
So results in terms of land cover, I'm first showing you the results of the business as usual scenario. So over a period of 20 years, uh, the land use model where we're trying to allocate uh, the demand for particular land use types such as uh, uh, urban land and, and agricultural land, etc. Um, it, it's the, the model showed that build-up area uh, was increasing, as you can see here at the bottom, whereas arable land and permanent crops pasture uh, decreased a little bit, it's a little bit more of abandonment in farmlands. Semi-natural uh, vegetation decreased the most, but um, often at the benefit of forests. With the introduction of the known at loss scenarios, we could actually see that under the more ambitious scenarios, I'm only listing three of them here, as one was very similar to, to others, um, the most uh, ambitious scenarios are able to, to reduce build-up area, but not hold it completely, since the demand for urban areas is still very high in Europe. Um, uh, slight further reduction in arable land and permanent crops, pastures are approximately the same, uh, farmland abandonment approximately the same, a less reduction, uh, so um, more semi-natural vegetation under the more uh, ambitious known at loss scenarios and also an increase in forest area. So these are just results in terms of land cover. Then if we're going to detail in terms of land take and land gain, this little table at the bottom, <clears throat> just to give you an indication of the square kilometers of uh, land take under the business as usual scenario, almost 65,000 uh, square kilometers uh, of basically habitat lost or agricultural land being built up. This number reduced under the known at loss scenarios. Um, if you look at the gain take ratio, if the ratio would be one, it would mean that you are gaining as much habitat as you're losing, and lower ratios mean that there's a loss of more natural land at the benefit of more anthropogenic land. <clears throat> so in terms of a map, it looks like this under the uh, business as usual scenario. The areas in red are the areas where uh, that become more built up, more intensively used, and the areas in blue are becoming less intensively used. <clears throat> How do known at loss scenarios change that? I'm just showing you the result for the best, the most ambitious known at loss scenario. You see that <clears throat> many areas become neutral, which means um, um, balancing losses and gains, whereas uh, certain areas are still red, which means that the losses there could not be uh, either fully avoided and or fully offset. They are mostly the um, the large uh, urban, urban agglomerations in European regions. Just a quick insight into high nature value farmlands. We also analyzed the results for that. And actually here you see that um, the more ambitious known at loss scenarios could achieve a net gain in terms of land take. So for particular habitat types, for particular uh, land use types, it's possible to achieve um, known at loss, even though not across the board. Some results for uh, bird species richness. Um, there is a clear upward trend, meaning a losses that are meaning that the losses are reduced for more ambitious no net loss scenarios. And the fact that scenario A, which is the second here, comes out worse than the business as usual scenario <clears throat> is explained by the fact that on the one hand there are stricter regulations in certain places such as Natura 2000 and high nature value farmland, but not in other. And this, in our land use model, creates a kind of leakage effect or a rebound effect, um, which means that you can't develop in certain places, but actually that development doesn't go away. It's, it's replaced to other areas where development is still allowed. And uh, balancing um, in terms of uh, the overall effect, it does more harm than good. So this demonstrates the importance of an a coherent set of measures along the mitigation hierarchy. And, and it indeed appears to work better in the more ambitious uh, scenarios. Just a quick zoom in for the Annex 1 bird species. We see a similar pattern, but under the most ambitious scenario, we did see a net gain for these most threatened species. Okay, just uh, some results for connectivity. Um, this basically uh, puts on an axis. This is the degree of fragmentation below the negative values of our more fragmentation, 
And close to cities, there is more fragmentation under the known at loss, uh, under this, excuse me, under the business as usual scenario. And further away from cities, there is less um, pressure, of course, from land use. And the avoidance and offsetting measures from the known at loss scenarios could clearly improve connectivity compared to the business as usual scenario. So even though known at loss is not achieved, there was more than 50% improvement. Then some results for ecosystem services, focusing on regulating and cultural ecosystem services. Here we plotted uh, the degree of land take. Positive means um, no, net, uh, no land take at all, at all anymore on an uh, average basis. And the negative means um, still, no, let, excuse me, still land take going on. Um, whereas, um, the, and compared to the changes in ecosystem services. So in green areas where land take was reduced and ecosystem services uh, were enhanced. In yellow, land take was reduced, but th this did not come with a benefit for ecosystem services. So there we see, um, where even though land take was reduced, it did not come as a, as a benefit to ecosystem services, which demonstrates that uh, just looking at land take in general is not sufficient. You also need to look at the composition and configuration of habitats and land cover in the landscape. So you need more careful spatial planning. Just for the sake of time, moving on. So the conclusions from this study were that no net loss policy measures in the EU27, as we modeled it, can be expected to substantially reduce losses for biodiversity and ecosystem services relative to a business as usual. Notably, uh, they can reduce impacts on the wider landscape. That is, in Europe, 82% of the uh, terrestrial surface. And these impacts are still frequently ignored in the discussions and applications of known at loss, which are still often tailored to endangered habitats and species, but especially for the less threatened species, habitats, and ecosystem services. There is still losses ongoing, but these could be substantially alleviated through measures like we tested here. The strictest scenario yielded net gains for Natura 2000 and high nature value farmland areas in terms of land take total bird species richness, and several regulating ecosystem services. <clears throat> However, full known at loss across the EU27 for biodiversity and ecosystem services is unlikely with the current levels of land demand. Just the yeah, levels of land demand in Europe are still really high. Metrics to measure losses and gains uh, must not only consider um, area, but also the landscape context, as with many ecosystem services, are sensitive to uh, land use composition and configuration. So area-based metrics alone, which are still common under uh, known at loss policies, show to be in insufficient in the study. So with that, I re refer you to the two reports. Uh, with, for more information, I would really like to thank our project partners and you for your attention. Astrid, thank you very much. Um, if I understand the results of these scenarios correctly, uh, what you're basically saying is that Europe will have a loss of ecosystem services and biodiversity. This is inevitable. No net loss is not possible in the European Union, even in the most optimistic scenario. Uh, how has that message come across, and what could we do about it? Um, thanks for the question. Um, well, one must consider the type of model we use. We modeled at a one, kilo, one square kilometer scale and using 18 different land use types. This is relatively coarse for uh, many, for many biodiversity features and, uh, and also some ecosystem services. Um, so. Um, there are certainly more options possible, but it needs more, um, um, if we really are reducing uh, land use demands by, by smarter building of cities, etc., that, that is still possible, but these are not yet on the, on the table. Um, so these also require more local solutions. Um, and the other, I forgot my other aspect of the... Your second part of the question was 
have you been able to communicate these results to people in a position to make uh, policy decisions? And um, how they responded? Well, we certainly have uh, communicated these results back to the, to the European Commission. Well, there have been follow-up studies uh, after this one. I mean, this one was already completed in 2014. Uh, looking more specifically indeed in the, into the impact assessments. I've not in, been involved in those. I cannot follow up on that. Um, but, but what I, I think these results clearly emphasize is that, well, perhaps known at, real known at loss uh, across the board is, is, is very hard to achieve with our gov given standards of, of living. Um, but that does not mean that there is a range of improvements possible compared to the business as usual scenario. So, I mean, as, as I think I've shown, for 82% for of the landscape, there are vast improvements possible. And um, one thing that the model, for example, could not account for was uh, land use intensity, so say agricultural intensity or forest in management intensity. Um, there are no wall-to-wall -wall maps available at present that um, show land use intensity for Europe, so we could not in in incorporate those. But many of the um, known at loss measures actually um, uh, um, uh, target the land, land management intensity. So there is also a lot to win in that respect, which are not captured by the models. Okay, thank you. Um, Astrid, we have a very quick question for clarification. Uh, why was bird species richness used as a measure? Um, well, ideally, uh, I would have liked to use um, like uh, models that can um, directly capture the effects of land use on each individual species, but such um, uh, data for, for many species across Europe are not really available. So we needed a composite indicator, which is like bird species richness. And um, it's just one indicator, I absolutely agree with that, and um, there are many other indicators possible, and I think uh, further work should look into more detailed levels. And I mean, just managing for bird species richness is not necessarily um, the best way to go. I mean, you can then, ex then then species are interchangeable, whereas that's not necessarily what you want. Wonderful. Great. Well, Astrid, thank you very much. And again, ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you, if you're listening and you have a question or are seeking some clarification on a point, please just go to the right-hand side of your screen click on the questions box, type in your question there, and uh, we will pick it up. But for now, I'd like to hand back to Fabien, who is going to talk about the tools for local level implementation of no-net loss. Fabien, are you there? I am. Great. Um, and you've got so screen on? I will guess. I'll Try to give some examples of, of uh, or actually use use a, a, an example to illustrate uh, local level implementation of, of the no net loss framework, and and hopefully with that uh, bring some clarity on some of the technical uh, challenges uh, for no net loss, uh, and also some of the organizational uh, challenges that we've looked at uh, in in operas. The the example I'll use is. <coughs> Is a railway project in southern France, uh, which uh, was uh, um, uh, designed uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, even before uh, the Natura 2000 site, which is uh, illustrated here in green, was established, uh, and actually established where the line uh, was uh, intended to be built. Um, and, and this project provided uh, uh, an interesting case study for some of the, of the thinking that we were doing in, in operas. Um, so the railway line is, is uh, crosses this natural 2000 site, uh, which is a mix of agricultural landscapes, some uh, uh, Mediterranean shrublands and forests, and, and a, a few uh, river valleys. The, the keystone, or, or emblematic uh, species, rather, uh, in, in this particular project is uh, the little bustard. Uh, that you can see on, on, the, on the top left here, which is a species that's uh, uh, undergone a considerable decline uh, in Europe, mainly because it's tied to extensive agricultural practices, which have been uh, um, which have been lost either to intensification or uh, land abandonment and subsequent uh, um, afforestation or or uh, simply moved into 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 shrubby habitats. 
Um, so uh, I mentioned in, in the first uh, presentation that one of the key uh, elements that you need to look at to, to be able to use the no net loss framework is to measure uh, uh, the biodiversity that you want to manage. And so one of the first steps in, in, in the approach is to uh, uh, agree on a metric uh, for assessing losses and gains. And so in this particular case, what we did uh, is uh, to look at habitat quality for the species uh, rather than simply area of habitat. If you remember my, my green uh, ecosystem from, from the, the theoretical example earlier, uh, in this case, uh, we tried to be a, more, a bit more subtle, and so we had a, a four-level scale of habitat quality rather than a binary uh, habitat or no habitat uh, approach. Uh, and this goes back also to Astrid's comment on the need to uh, have more detailed information on land use intensity and on the characteristics of uh, the ecosystem that you're looking at in relation to the biodiversity feature or the ecosystem service that you want to look at. So we had these maps and, and we, uh, we produced them uh, um, looking at vegetation but also looking at, at uh, the distribution uh, of the species and, and behavioral patterns. Uh, and with that we were able to uh, feed uh, or inform a loss-gain approach uh, where uh, we could compare uh, the conversion of say a species rich meadow in the top left into a railway line or a, uh, uh, a simpler, less diverse uh, type grassland in the bottom left also into a railway line. We could compare uh, uh, these two uh, impacts of the project uh, on a similar scale of changes in habitat quality, going from three to zero, for example, at the top, or two to zero at the bottom. And of course, uh, you need to do that also on the offset side if you want to be able to demonstrate uh, no net loss. And so uh, what we looked at were options for improving habitat quality for the same species of bird. Uh, for example, by converting um, orchards, which is an unfavorable habitat for the, for the species, uh, into those species rich meadows, uh, or uh, making more subtle changes to management of existing grasslands uh, at the bottom. You see here that these two offset options don't bring about the same gain per unit area. Um, and this is important then in terms of sizing uh, the overall offset that you need to achieve no net loss uh, at the project level. Um, another advantage of, of uh, this uh, more explicit approach uh, to no net loss is that it uh, gives you a catalog of options uh, for generating gains, which gives you more flexibility for actually uh, making those gains achievable. For example, if you need to discuss with farmers uh, on what sort of land use changes or management changes uh, they could uh, implement on their land uh, to uh, benefit the species, rather than coming with a blanket goal of securing so many hectares of land uh, for, uh, for protection uh, and, and basically scaring people away uh, with a message that you're taking their land uh, to create a new protected area. So th this, this had some, some advantages. Um, everything I've just said is, is about adopting a, a loss-gain approach uh, for a particular species. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, often there, there are many species that need to be dealt with. Uh, and in this particular case, we had more than 120 protected species along the, the railway line, and no net loss or net gain had have, have to be demonstrated for each and every one of them. Uh, there were a few uh, protected habitats as well. Um, and so one thing that we uh, had to work through was uh, an analytical framework uh, that uh, was able to handle uh, the fact that many species actually coexist within a particular type of ecosystem and could actually be managed as a cohort or, or uh, in any case as a set of coexisting species where the subsequent offset design uh, could be based on improving uh, overall habitat quality for that whole set of species. Uh, and the final, uh, I mean, one of the consequences of this is that uh, in effect you're building your offset strategy on uh, the species uh, within the habitat that has the, the 
the highest requirement. Uh, and so you actually end up with an offset strategy that uh, generates uh, net gains for some species uh, because they uh, uh, are more readily benefit uh, from the uh, from the offset actions that were designed for those species that uh, for which uh, gains are, are harder to achieve. So I'm not I'm not going to present you the actual analytics of this. It would, it would take way too long. Uh, but the solutions are there, and they are built on uh, existing approaches for, uh, for multi-criteria multi decision-making. Um, another key aspect, I guess, of, of this issue of metrics and loss-gain approaches is uh, um, that they take time to develop. Um, and as you have guessed in the example I gave, 120 protected species, that includes a lot of actually common species that are impacted very frequently. Uh, and so one of the, uh, um, one of the, I guess, interesting uh, uh, dynamics at the moment um, around no net loss and offsets is uh, a, a move towards more standardized uh, approaches to assessing possible gains, uh, developing more reproducible and robust assessment methods. And so uh, in relation with operas, uh, but also with other uh, partners, uh, such as the ones listed here, uh, there's been some work in developing such methods. Uh, an example is uh, uh, a new national method for assessing uh, wetland functions uh, that, that was uh, published last year. And then another method uh, published earlier this year uh, on how to uh, assess habitat quality for widespread habitats uh, that might be impacted uh, um, uh, accidentally rather than intentionally in this case. But the, the methods apply uh, equally well. Um, someone asked uh, earlier uh, whether or not ecosystem services could or should be included in the mitigation hierarchy and the no net loss framework. Uh, this is something we looked at also. Um, there was an interesting publication by uh, Céline Jacob in ecosystem services last year on this. Uh, some of the main, I guess, uh, points to raise here are first that there is currently no EU legal framework that requires this from developers, but that some member states have been looking at uh, things that could be labeled as ecosystem services uh, in in their um, in their policy framework. Another important aspect, I think, is that a lot of the discussion on ecosystem services uh, in the context of project permitting. Uh, uh, take some somewhat of a technocratic approach to it, uh, and uh, it's easy to forget that in Europe we have a particular characteristic: is that uh, there are quite strong public consultation requirements for developers, where people are actually asked what their concerns are, and uh, uh, um, and if and 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 what impacts uh, a project might have on their livelihoods, on their uh, uh, on their values, and how they use a landscape and inhabit an area. Um, and so uh, there really is a question that, that uh, uh, is, is worth uh, putting forward, is, is do we need uh, this uh, uh, more formal ecosystem service approach uh, as an extra uh, tool uh, to these public consultation uh, requirements? There, is a, there are opportunities in doing that, uh, uh, and in particular, it would enable to maybe to account for some of the overlooked uh, values and concerns. Um, and then there's this risk that I mentioned earlier about uh, moving from strong sustainability requirements, uh, species for species, habitat for habitat, to perhaps uh, uh, a softer version of sustainability where uh, things are, are easier to substitute. And so you could lose a species if you gain an ecosystem service. Um, so this is about the assessment uh, approach, uh, but I think it's also important to remember that all this then has to uh, uh, lead to actual implementation. And so in this project that I mentioned, the railway line, uh, it's going to be operated for 25 years and so uh, as part of the concession agreement. And so the developer has committed uh, to uh, known loss over that time period. And to achieve this, uh, the current uh, portfolio of offsets includes actually a diversity uh, of, of actions on the ground, including afforestation, uh, protection, uh, and 
um, changes in management of farmland. And this has been done uh, through the purchasing of land and then leasing it to farmers uh, with a particular uh, set of requirements, but also signing contracts with existing farmers. And that's actually the, 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 the biggest component of this offsetting framework. And so here we see that there is a, a quite a strong overlap between uh, the biodiversity offsets discussion and uh, the considerable experience that Europe has in, in the developing agri-environmental schemes and working with farmers to achieve biodiversity goals. Um, and so we, we, this is a, an issue that we explored uh, quite extensively in operas, uh, looking at uh, contract-based payments for offset implementation, uh, some recent work that was done in northern France uh, doing a, a choice experiment with farmers there on converting agricultural land to grasslands. Uh, this is uh, very much ongoing. Um, similar work was done uh, on, the, on the railway line, looking at the content of the contracts that were signed with farmers. Um, before we, we uh, uh, just to, to move on, I, I think it's important to, to, to mention a, another key aspect of implementation is, is uh, how do you locate those offsets? And in the, in the particular case of the railway line, uh, because it was contract based, um, it was somewhat opportunistic. Uh, willing farmers signed up and others didn't, and so the offsets are actually distributed across the landscape uh, on either side of the railway line, which on the left, on the right-hand side picture is is drawn as the grey line, and then you have the offset sites in colour. Um, and this this is really a, a, an essential question from a conservation point of view, and, and so Astrid and I uh, contributed to uh, uh, some thinking on this and and the need to be more proactive. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, locating offsets so that they actually contribute to restoration goals uh, um, in a, or conservation goals in a landscape. Um, we, we then also uh, did some uh, local level modeling of uh, these uh, sorts of questions, uh, in this case in collaboration with uh, the CNRS lab in Grenoble as part of operas. Uh, there's an area there around the city of Grenoble uh, where land use change scenarios uh, forecast uh, not the loss of, of wetlands. And so we, we try to look at different uh, mechanisms for offsetting those losses as part uh, uh, of, of operas, looking at whether the offsets uh, were better if they were aggregated. So you offset all of your impacts in one uh, uh, offset operation, or if you, uh, or if you spread them out, and if you use as a metric uh, simply area or uh, uh, a more quantitative metric based on wetland functions, and um, well, the conclusion is is uh, is that uh, um, aggregated and function based uh, offsets uh, are more likely to uh, enable no net loss to be achieved. Uh, the good thing with modeling is that you can do repetitions, uh, which isn't the case when you're working on uh, an actual railway line, for example. Um, and th this work is uh, was uh, was also published at the end of last year. Um, what's interesting with uh, with offsets also is that it's uh, uh, it's a very good uh, context in which to use uh, a lot of the thinking that's. Uh, 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 that's, that has occurred in, in the field of, of ecology on, on metapopulations and fragmentation uh, and how to sustain viable populations of species in landscapes that are sub subject to change. Um, and so uh, uh, one of the conclusions uh, from, from work in operas um, is that if you're trying to achieve no net loss uh, for certain species or certain habitat types uh, by moving those habitats around, uh, losing them where you have the impacts, recreating them uh, where you have your offsets. Uh, well, that works for some species in some types of habitats. Uh, the ones that can cope uh, with spatial change, uh, um, but it's not going to work for all of them. So this is important to, to keep in mind. Um, however, for those that can, uh, it really makes sense uh, to uh, uh, set up a system uh, where you actually uh, have a strategic approach 
to where you're going to locate you're going to locate the offset sites and what particular losses uh, are going to happen. Can and my I, final um, yes. Yes. Uh, just going to say it's coming up to two o'clock. We need to wrap it up, unfortunately. Okay, this is my last slide. Just a, a reminder of some of the key design elements for offsets that uh, uh, need to be looked at when actually implementing the no net loss framework uh, in practice. Great. Fabian, thank you very much. And thank you also to our audience for taking the time to listen in. Uh, just a reminder, the last of our webinar series was uh, taking place this coming Monday at the same time and looking at stakeholder engagement in the ecosystem services. So if you're able to join us for that, then please do so. But uh, then I'd just like to end by thanking both Astrid and Fabien for these presentations. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>